good afternoon everyone if you can see me and hear me properly please uh, type and write we can see and hear you so that I can start my session straight away Uh, Vinod Bumbatkar uh, is written, is it for class 10 only? See, you can attend class 10. I have tried to design it in a way uh, so that it is okay with class 9th, class 10th, class 11th, class 12th. Even, you know, some medical students, if they want, they can see it as well. So I have kept today's class uh, at a level which is, you know, uh, going to be a little bit high, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be very, very useful because the amount of uh, research that I did and, and the study that I did uh, to ensure that it becomes a, such a, such a uh, class that it can be uh, for everyone. It can be studied by everyone and it can be listened to by everyone. So great. Now I will shift to my uh, slides. I will reduce my picture so that you do not miss the slides over here. Uh, I'll minim make it minimum and then I will be going into the PowerPoint presentation and today we will be trying to go for a uh, full screen because that will be helpful I think uh, seeing me is not so important over here now the video that I have made it's going to be very very useful so be very attentive today and uh, do not type things when I am I'm teaching uh, then I will be getting diverted I will give you breaks after every few uh, topics that I cover. During that time, you can you can write something and uh, ask me, right? But you can keep it interactive. What I meant is you can write things, normal things on the chat. But whenever you're asking a question, type that question in capital, all caps, so that I can see it easily, right? And wait till I finish my class and then you can ask all the, uh, clarify all the doubts. And today's class we are going to take a little bit longer because it is dealing with something very very important and uh, a little bit complicated as well if you think that way but otherwise it's very easy don't worry so uh, we have discussed about the entire elementary canal elementary canal consists of a long muscular tube about nine meters long that passes through the body cavity from mouth to the anus so from mouth to the anus it's the long tube a part of the tube is dilated which is the stomach and then it's of different shape and structure but these are all parts of the same tube called elementary canal and do you know that the first thing that uh, you know the first thing that is produced when when a new child is to be born is the digestive canal Immediately after the blastula, the first channel that you see in the blastula is the digestive tract, which later develops and becomes a digestive canal or a digestive tract. So parts of the elementary canal. So etymology means the meaning of the word, where the word has come from. Etymology is element. Element is the word which means food, khana. Ari means pertaining to or related to. So etymology means something related to food. So that is how elementary canal has come, which means the canal related to the foods. Now what are the parts? Lips, tongue, mouth. Lips, tongue together can form the mouth as well. We can call that a mouth as well. Buccal cavity, that is the oral cavity. Pharynx, the the buccal cavity leads to the pharynx and then the pipe starts which is called the esophagus and then the stomach uh, the spelling is wrong over here uh, i didn't type it properly in a hurry so s-t-o-m-s-c-h small intestine large intestine and the anus so these are the parts we have already heard about uh, the reason i want to show you this picture is see where they are located so uh, these are salivary glands three are there sublingual submaxillary and parotid so these salivary glands are located where you can see those glands sublingual just under the teeth parotid is near the parotid gland and submaxillary is below the maxilla maxilla so uh, next is esophagus food pipe 
Stomach is located slightly to the left hand side. On the right hand side we have the liver. Under the liver there is a gallbladder. Pancreas is the organ which is near to the stomach and liver. It's, it's parallel to that. And large and small intestine. After the stomach and small intestine starts, the large intestine and the anus. So we have already done these things. Uh, just hold on a minute. I, I don't think you can see the video as well. Uh, let me check. Yeah, slide is not playing properly. Let me see. I will go for display capture rather. Uh, let me just uh, check what I can do about it. Yeah, now it is there, right? So you can see it now. Is it okay? Is it okay? Can see right then that I can see. See, I'll tell you one more thing. The pictures that you see will not be clear. You can take a screenshot or you can change your display setting into 480p and it will be clear to you. If you cannot see, you wait for some time, you take a screenshot or something and then you can see by later on by zooming. Because most of you are seeing on mobile phones, the clarity of that thing will not be there. Just see if you can see the written part properly, that will be good enough. Now again, do not worry about the picture. The pictures and slides, I will give you later on. You can use these slides for, for studying. Don't worry about that. Whatever picture is not clear, if you would have seen in a bigger screen, it would have been clear for you. So now, digestive glands. There are three digestive glands attached or working along with the other parts like the esophagus, stomach. These are all digestive structures, parts of the alimentary canal. And the glands related are salivary gland, liver and pancreas. So see how they are located. You can see this is the liver. This is the pancreas. Under the liver, there is this green structure called gall gallbladder. And this is the duodenum this is the duodenum liver is the largest gland of the body it is situated in the upper part of the abdomen just below the diaphragm so diaphragm is here diaphragm is here i, I do not know whether you can see me properly i'll stand up and show you. diaphragm is here and the right side of the body the right side of the body the liver is located so where i'm putting my hand roughly right now that is the location of the river where i'm putting my hand roughly right now can you see me uh, this is the position of the liver right now the thing is liver is covered by the ribs normally it is it cannot be felt but whenever there is a disorder of the liver it enlarges and then the liver can be felt so enlargement of the liver is called hepatomegaly. Anything related to the liver is hepato, that is hepatic or hepato related to the liver. And hepatomegaly is enlargement of the liver. When it can be felt, it means the liver is not well. If the liver is well, normally from the surface, you cannot feel it. Now we'll go to the next part. We'll see what happens in ease of these parts. The cheeks and the lips, they are highly sensitive and help in detecting the degree of hotness and texture of the food. So the cheeks and the lips, what is the function of that? These organs in digestion, they can understand and feel the heat of the food, how hot it is, whether it's easy for the person to swallow it or not, eat it or not. If it's too hot, we do not eat it. So that is very important. And the next is texture of the food. So texture of the food, if it is proper, then that also can be felt by the cheek and the lips the tongue is a thick muscular organ covered by mucus so again mucus spelling is wrong over here in a hurry so tongue is a thick muscular organ covered by mucous membrane it contains what the tongue contains taste buds now are you aware that different taste buds are located in different parts of the tongue 
So uh, behind the tongue there are certain taste buds which tastes bitterness. That's the reason we see that whenever you eat something bitter, you can feel it in the throat because the taste buds of bitterness is located at the back. And sides are uh, something like salty, sweet. So there are different taste buds are located in the different parts of the tongue. The palate. The palate forms the roof of the mouth. That one. So palate forms the roof of the mouth. And there are two palates. Hard palate, which is the beginning. Uh, the anterior part anterior means the front part and the posterior part or the back part is called the soft palate so that is the palate what is the function of the palate the function of the palate is it acts as a it, it provides the room it, it functions as a room right now the teeth the teeth are responsible for physical and mechanical digestion what is physical and mechanical digestion physical and mechanical digestion is what the teeth does it cuts grinds crushes and then the other part happens that is chemical digestion or biochemical digestion so teeth is the organ which causes physical and mechanical digestion now there are uh, three pairs of salivary gland as i said sub mandibular sub mandibular gl gland so below the mandibles, uh, I'm sorry, I used the word submaxillary. It's actually submandibular. I showed it as a mandible. So this is the mandible and this is the maxilla. So submandibular gland, so I located here. Parotid glands located here. And the sublingual, that is sub means below. Sub inspector, below the inspector. So sublingual, below the tongue. Lingua, lingua means comes from language. You can remember that way. Lingua, language, language, tongue. So sublingual and it contains what it contains it contains water mucus salts salivary amylase enzyme and lysozyme so i again repeat water mucus salts salivary amylase and the salivary amylase enzyme and the lysozyme lysozyme was discovered in 1921 by sir alexander fleming lysozyme catalyzes the breakdown of certain carbohydrates found in the cell wall of certain bacteria so lysozyme can actually uh, cause damage to the bacteria and it's so bactericidal in nature bactericidal in nature so these can stop bacteria from growing so see the beauty of the saliva it uh, or the uh, salivary glands it secretes something like water to keep the food moist turn it into a bolus mucus salts there are different salts we'll read about those salts later on but again just to make it easy sodium salts potassium salts magnesium salts calcium salts all these salts are present in our uh, saliva and then a lysozyme that is a bacteria killing enzyme discovered by alexander fleming do not forget that the same person who discovered penicillin salivary secretions what it contains saliva contains water salts mucus enzyme called salivary amylase or tylin and lysozyme so function of saliva is it moistens the food particles and helps in swallowing binds food particles together to form the bolus helps clean mouth and teeth lysozyme kill bacteria and it starts the chemical digestion of carbohydrates so these are the functions of saliva so if you get a question in the examination what is the function of the saliva you can make points like these and answer so it moistens food particles, binds food particles together to form the bolus, helps clean the mouth and the teeth, lysozyme kills bacteria and starts chemical digestion of carbohydrate. Let's go to the next one. So composition of saliva is composed of a variety of electrolytes. So I was talking about the salts. It includes sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, bicarbonates and phosphates. Also found in the saliva are immunoglobulins. So immunoglobulins are, uh, you know, particles which are responsible for uh, immunity. Protein in nature, globulin is a protein. So immunoglobulins are structures of protein which binds with specific antigens and uh, antibody re antigen reaction happens because of immunoglobulins, which you will study in later immunity chapter when you go, uh, grow up higher, uh, go to higher classes. So immunoglobulins are there in the uh, saliva. So there itself, it, it will be 
you know, neutralizing a few antigens by the antigen antibody reaction. And proteins are there, enzymes are there, mucins are there, and nitrogenous products such as urea and ammonia. Now, you must be wondering what is a mucin? So, what is a mucin? A mucin are family of large, heavily glycosylated proteins. Mucins are family of large, heavily glycosylated proteins. Although some mucins are membrane bound due to the presence of hydrophobic membrane spanning domain that favors the retention of the plasma membrane, the concentration here is on those mucins that are secreted from the mucosal surface of the saliva. Do not worry about the complexity of all the sentences I just spoke. It's nothing not to be worried about. So just remember, mucins are family of large, highly glycosylated proteins. Now I will ask a question and let me test you. Who can say, who can say over here, what is a glycosylated protein? What is the meaning of glycosylation? I'm waiting for your answer now. What is a glycosylated protein? I said it's a glycosylated protein. What it is? Now let me check all the students who, who are good, good readers of the books, different books. What is a glycosylated protein? Uh, Vedant Tiwari, mucin spelling is M-U-C-I-N, not S-I-N. Glycosylated protein. Rohan, Nandini, Ameya, Soham. Are you there? Kushnagra said mixture of glucose maybe. Glycosylated proteins. Very good. So uh, Kush is very clear and very close. Now you people are Googling up. Do not Google. When you are attending the class, you do not sit with Google open, okay? Then it will stop your learning. You cannot learn with Google open. Glycosylated is, it's a, it's a reaction where glucose is attached with protein. Uh, carbohydrates are joined with other molecules to form a large molecule. No, glycosylated is protein is joined with glucose. Yeah, Ravindra Patil says it's addition of carbohydrates to proteins where one is a donor, the other is an acceptor. So glycosylated proteins. So mucins are glycosylated proteins. Very good, wonderful. So now let's come to the uh, slides one more time. So there are nitrogenous products such as urea and ammonia. So in the saliva, we never knew so many things are there, right? It contains so many things, electrolytes, sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, bicarbonate, phosphate, immunoglobulin, protein, enzymes, mucins, nitrogenous products, urea, ammonia. Oof. In this saliva, so many things. Can you believe it? Simple thing to moisten our mouth. And we spit it out at times. When we spit it out, you think so many things from the body is going out, right? So jokes apart, we'll come to the next part. So we've covered composition of saliva. And now it's just for info. Just for info, uh, I'll show a graph to you, a video graph, uh, because certain slides may not be clear. I have taken certain pictures from internet because I this is a, a lockdown period going on right now. I cannot make my computer teachers or art teachers design something for me. But as of now, I use something from the net. And you can see the picture and functions of saliva. Antibacterial causes buffering, slowing down certain things. Digestion, mineralization, lubrication and viscoelasticity. Then antifungal, tissue coating, antiviral, antibacterial. So antibacterial, saliva is antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal. Now I'm just wondering if it's antiviral, can it really do something to the coronavirus? So um, I wish it could have. So antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal, and it has got digestive function, mineralization, and lubrication of viscosity and elasticity and tissue coating. It forms a tissue coating. Uh, 
Now there are other organs, uh, other chemicals which I did not name, but I'll very quickly tell this just for information. It will not come in your 10th exam, board exam, but just for your information, here are the terms when you give the competitive exams like NEAT, uh, if these terms come ever, you can at least answer it. Or even if it doesn't come, what's harm in getting the knowledge? So there are terms like cystatins, histatins, and statherins. So uh, what are these things? Cystatins, histatins, and statherins. We'll go back and see. Statherin is a protein in humans that is encoded by stath gene. So there's a gene called stath gene. It's encoded with that gene. It prevents the precipitation of calcium phosphate in saliva, maintaining high calcium level in saliva available for remineralization of tooth enamel and high phosphate levels for buffering. So you see uh, what it does? The tooth enamel that we have is ha having calcium. So it prevents the precipitation of calcium phosphate in saliva. So there's calcium, there is phosphate, there's a high chance that the precipitation happens in the mouth. So this statherin prevents that from happening. What are cystatins? Cystatins are cysteine protease inhibitors present in the variety of tissues and body fluids, including saliva. One possible function of these molecules may be to modulate tissue destruction in peri periodontal disease. So the periodontal diseases where tissue is degenerating or destructing, it modulates or it controls. So cystatins are doing that. What are histatins doing? Histatins are histidine-rich antimicrobial proteins found in saliva. Histatins involved in antimicrobial activities makes histatin part of the innate immune system. So histatin that is present in the saliva is histatin, uh, histidine-rich antimicrobial protein and it has you know, protective function. Mucin, a family of large, heavily glycosylated protein, which we have already covered. So statherin prevents precipitation of calcium phosphate in the mouth. Cystatins, these are, uh, modulate the tissue destruction of periodontal diseases. Histatins, it uh, is protective in nature. And mucins are glycosylated proteins. So I hope you have understood it. I'll take a small break uh, for one minute for you to see uh, like think and check if you have understood everything i'll in the meantime go to the chat and see if any questions any questions with whatever i've taught so mouth digestion over now we'll go slowly into stomach digestion so tell me now if you have a question mouth digestion i just wanted to add one more thing chemical digestion that happens in the mouth the starch in complex sugars is broken down into maltose now earlier I told you glucose because I felt you will be understanding glucose a little bit better. But actually what happens when the starch is broken down under the action of tylen, it is broken down into something called maltose. And what is a maltose? Maltose is a chain of glucose, right? So it's a, it's a two glucose particles attach each other and this is the maltose. So maltose is actually the thing that you feel sweet when you chew a bit of rice. Try that today at home. You take a little bit of rice before you eat any, any sabji or anything. Take a little bit of rice and start chewing it. And you will find that after some time, if you have mixed it thoroughly with your salivary amylase, that is saliva, you will see it taste sweet because it's converted into, from starch into maltose. So just... Uh, think if you have any question. Now, uh, someone has asked me what is the function of palate. It is responsible for closing off the nasal passage during the act of swallowing. So, nose and mouth, these channels are connected to each other. So, soft palate, that is responsible for closing the nasal passage during the act of swallowing and also for closing of the airway so the palate is also closing of the airway epiglottis is also for there during sneezing it protects the nasal passage by diverting a portion of the excreted substance to the mouth so during sneezing uh, because it's coming with so much force a little bit of diverted into the mouth so after sneezing you find something coming to your mouth as well because if it's only the nose it would have been exerting a lot of pressure so this is the function of the palate. Apart from giving a bony protective covering, 
it acts in a way like uh, you know uh, during swallowing and during sneezing these are the protective functions of the palate does lysozyme swallow whole cell with enzyme lysozyme just breaks down the carbohydrate covering of the bacteria that they have so when a bacteria cell is broken down it ties the bacteria is killed the lysozyme actually the bacteria is not harmful understand this we have got hundreds and thousands of bacteria within us it is the poison or the toxin that is given by the bacteria is harmful so what lysozyme does is basically it kills the bacteria itself so when it is killed it cannot give the poison anymore the toxins cannot come out and we are safe Naeem Ahmad Siddiqui, isomaltose is, its salivary hydrolysis about 30 to 40 percent. Uh, Amaya Bombarkar says saliva contains small amount of ammonia, but ammonia is harmful for our health. But why does it, doesn't it harm, harm us? It's, it's in very trace amount. It's in very trace amount. That's the reason it does not harm you. For anything to harm you, it has to be beyond a threshold limit. Any other question? Let me just check very quickly. What about amylase? Amylase, I already told, it breaks down the starch into maltose. It breaks down the starch into maltose. Okay, great. Now we will start to the next part. Good. So we will go now to the digestion of mouth is over. And we see, uh, this is a very simple chart that I have drawn for you. So starch and glycogen under the action of amylase is broken down into maltose maltose under the action of maltase is broken down into monosaccharides now where is maltase we will see later on sucrose under the action of sucrase breaks down into glucose and fructose and lactose under the action of lactase breaks down into glucose and galactose now i told you ase means an enzyme which will break down so lactose to be broken down by lactase sucrose by sucrase maltose by maltase so the ultimate aim is the polysaccharides to be converted into monosaccharide and monosaccharides you see is glucose, fructose, galactose and the disaccharides are maltose, sucrose and lactose. So in the mouth what happens starch is broken down under the action of amylase into maltose. Now let's come to the esophagus. I hope the mouth digestion is clear with you. The esophagus is about 25 centimeters in length, extending from the pharynx to the stomach, right? So pharynx to stomach, you just see the picture properly once. Right, so if you see uh, the length of the esophagus is given over here, uh, 25 is actually midway starting from the mouth. So if you see 15 to 45, this is the scale. So 15 to 45 is how much? 25, 35, 45, 30 centimeters. But 30, uh, 30 centimeters is still the fundus of the stomach. So it's actually 25 centimeters in length. Do not worry about the different portions, but I just wanted to show you from mouth, then these are the rib cages, and it has been divided into cervical esophagus, upper thoracic esophagus, middle thoracic esophagus, and lower thoracic esophagus. So when the esophagus moves from different parts of the thorax or the chest cavity, it is called upper thoracic, middle thoracic, and lower thoracic. Nothing to be much complicated about. Now let's go to the next slide. The stomach. So after the esophagus, we reach the stomach. 
stomach secretions mucus cells produce mucus and protects the stomach from action of hydrochloric acid we already read certain things earlier right that stomach produces hydrochloric acid so the mucus is secreted by the mucus cells and it protects the stomach from hydrochloric acid which is very very acidic in nature ph is 1 parietal cells secrete hydrochloric acid i'll show you the picture in the diagram how parietal cell looks like so remember the hydrochloric acid is secreted by a group of cells inside the stomach lumen which are called parietal cells and the chief cells secrete pepsin so chief cells are another group of cells of the stomach lining and it secretes what it secretes pepsin as an inactive pepsinogen which activated when it comes in contact with hydrochloric acid see pepsin is actually the digestive enzyme which is in form of pepsinogen now moment food comes inside the stomach hydrochloric acid is secreted moment hydrochloric acid is secreted the pepsinogen which was inactive under the action of hydrochloric acid gets converted to pepsin and starts working on the protein so isn't this wonderful god's creation that what happened that pepsinogen it's not normal in form of pepsin in the stomach but only when food comes in only when food comes in and under the action of hydrochloric acid it will get converted into pepsin to digest the food particles or the proteins it also secretes uh, wrong spelling i'll correct it it also secrete renin which helps in digestion of milk protein i'll color that red for you to understand so renin which helps in milk protein now uh, renin if you know like you know it's actually present in the children the children below six months age they they are only on milk so when children are only on milk this renin is secreted and that renin converts the milk protein into something something that is digestible we'll see what it is now we'll see the picture first now quick revision parietal cells produce hydrochloric acid chief cells produce pepsin as inactive pepsinogen and also secretes renin which converts milk protein into lower protein chains now look at this picture secretory cells of the gastric gland wonderful secretory cells of the gastric gland i hope you are able to see the picture nice and clear so this is the gastric gland and you see there are these are the chief cells chief cells and parietal cells uh, so you know chief cells and parietal cells are located over here i will try to show you a picture which is a bit clearer just hold on a minute i'll show you uh, i'll try to show uh, pull up a picture chief cells and parietal cells let me see if i find a better picture for you but as of now just remember that these are the cells located in the stomach mainly i'm getting microscopical pictures but i'm pretty sure in the google if you go for googling you will get better pictures as well so right now uh, just understand this with this picture that i found as of now for you that there are parietal cells and chief cells which secrete these uh, hydrochloric acid and pepsin right so renin now let's go to the next part renin is a proteolytic enzyme found in the gastric juices of infants i already told about it it is responsible for digestion of milk protein casein by curdling of milk so it causes curdling of milk milk protein is called casein and it is curdled in the absence of renin pepsin also causes curdling of milk so when adults drink milk hello what's happening so when adults drink milk what happens in the absence of renin we will get pepsin to i'm so sorry this desktop is functioning weird uh anyway so in the absence of milk 
uh, sorry, in the absence of renin, the pepsin acts on the milk and converts that into paracasein. So uh, I'll very quickly go for the reaction. Pepsinogen, under the action of hydrochloric acid, forms pepsin. So proteins acted by, upon by pepsin causes, brings in proteoses and peptones. We are going to cover what are these as well. What are the differences between proteoses and peptones? Then prorenin, under the action of hydrochloric acid, is renin. See, just like we had got pepsinogen, which becomes pepsin under the action of HCl, prorenin, which is again an inactive form of renin, under the action of hydrochloric acid, becomes renin. And this renin acts on the milk protein and convert that first into paracasin. And paracasin is converted into calcium paracasinate. So scientific name of curd is calcium paracasinate. So paracasin is a result of renin acting on the milk protein and paracasin is converted into calcium paracasinate which is curd. Calcium paracasinate now curd being acted on on peptin, uh, pepsin becomes peptones. So calcium paracasinate acted upon by pepsin becomes peptones. Uh, Gayatri, do not go be before I be before me, right? Uh, stay along with me so that you can understand. These are not so easy things. So duodenum we will come later on. As of now we are covering only stomach, right? So once we cover the stomach, we will go to duodenum. Uh, Arthi Bandaria said, chief cells are also called peptic cells. Yes, they are. Now good. So understand one thing, pepsinogen converted into pepsin under action of hydrochloric acid. Prorenin converted into renin under the action of hydrochloric acid. Now prorenin is present in the earlier part of life of a person when they are infants and children. As they grow older, it is slowly replaced by pepsinogen and pepsin. Casein of the milk, which is the milk protein, the name of the milk protein is casein, under the action of renin is converted into paracasein and paracasein is converted into calcium paracasinate or calcium paracasinate is known as curd as well, which is again acted upon by pepsin and form peptones. So I hope this is clear. Now we'll go into what are peptides, proteoses and peptones. So those who are not very clear what are peptides, proteoses and peptones, let's have a very quick overview of these three terms. Peptides are referred to at least two amino acids joined by amide bonds. So just remember this much. Do not go too much deep into the biochemistry. It's, it's an unending sea. It, it will never finish. You can go deeper and deeper and ultimately from biology will reach to advanced chemistry. So we will try to restrict ourselves to a portion which is good enough for us. A little bit above the class knowledge. So peptides refers to at least two amino acids joined by amide bonds. So they are joined by amide bonds. Now what proteoses are? Proteoses are products of acid proteolysis which precipitate with saturating ammonium sulfate. Now remember this, are products of acid proteolysis. Acid causing protein to lyse or break. So proteoses are results of acid proteolysis. That is acid causing the breakdown of protein. Proteolysis, breakdown of protein. Proteo means protein, lysis means breakdown. So acid causing the proteolysis which precipitate with saturating ammonium sulfate. So ammonium sulfate precipitation happens over here. And peptones are products of acid proteolysis which do not precipitate with saturating ammonium sulfate. So ammonium sulfate is a differentiating factor. In proteoses, it precipitates with ammonium sulfate, saturating ammonium sulfate, and in peptones, it does not saturate with ammonium sulfate. So understand this is a very, very technical term, just to give you a clear concept that how these differs both are results of acid proteolysis in which saturating ammonium sulfate is there and another one saturating ammonium sulfate is not there. Do not go deeper than this, it's enough for you. Now let's see the gastric lumen. The gastric lumen, how it looks like. Now you see, this is the blood capillary. Above that, the interstitial fluid, surface mucus cells, epithelial junctions, mucus bicarbonate barrier, there's a bicarbonate barrier in the gastric lumen. This is the blue part that I'm pointing at. HCO3, H+, H2O, 
plus CO2 form, forms this uh, bicarbonate layer barrier and this bicarbonate barrier prevents the H plus this is the gastric lumen where the pH as you can see is 1 and 2 and lot of uh, you know protons lot of protons or hydrogen uh, ions are moving around in this zone because this zone is extremely acidic but this acid cannot reach the epithelial junctions mainly because it's protected by the mucus bicarbonate barrier so this bicarbonate barrier stops the hydro, uh, hydrogen ions or acid acids to act on the mucus layer so the pH is 1 and 2 over here and the protective covering is the mucus lining so just to get a clear idea how it looks like this is how it looks like and at the end there will be capillary which is responsible for blood flow so I hope you just take a look at this uh, I wish you take a look at this uh, uh, picture and understand what is the pH level at different parts of the stomach so at the surface that is inside the lumen it is one, 1 1.5 or 2 1 and 2 in between 1 and 2 so 1.5 the layer where it meets the bicarbonate layer it's 2 because that is where the neutralization starts happening this picture if you see I'll try to blow up a little bit this picture if you can see it clearly see this part acid acts on that and reaction is happening reaction is happening in this part and that is the reason the pH of this part is 2 and then the pH of bicarbonate layer is 7 which is very very neutral in nature and slightly alkaline rather and then uh, epithelial cells are here now next I think the gastric lumen is done in gastric lumen the proteins are being acted upon now let me just add over here if I've missed that out earlier in the mouth along with the amylase there are little bit of fat breaking enzymes as well these are called salivary lipase and there are certain enzymes which very trace amount but it breaks proteins as well so salivary protease as well are there along with the amylase so amylase is more in quantity more useful in saliva and then lipase and amylase and protease uh, this protease and lipase both are there in trace amount now let's go to the digestion of the small intestine so you people were asking me yeah bolus uh, soham has written peristaltic movement helps in non movement bolus okay i think kedar asked a question soham answered it good okay so gayatri uh, your net is slow do not worry this video will be recorded and you can watch that video later on the part that you are missing don't worry about it now let's go to the small intestine I hope the stomach digestion process is clear we'll very quickly go to the small intestine today we are going to have a little bit longer class I told because we want to cover the small small chemical reactions that is there in digestive process are you okay with me are you willing to continue or you want me to stop sharp at one I'm waiting for your response so if you are finding it interesting the chemical reactions we will go a little bit beyond otherwise we'll stop sharp at 110 so if you write continue I will understand you want me to continue otherwise if you want me to stop you can write we will end up at 110 what reacts on curd to convert it pepsin pepsin on the acts on the curd which is calcium paracassinate and it's converted into peptones this reaction if you remember Anj Chaudhary what's your question yeah I've answered your question right now okay most of you want me to continue that's good right now we will go into the digestion of the small intestine the digestion and absorption of food take place in the small intestine and in duodenum the food is simultaneously acted upon by bile pancreatic and intestinal juices so we have read that earlier right when we were doing the basics in the last two days we have studied 
that there is bile, there is pancreatic juice, and there are intestinal juice that comes and drops into the duodenum, and there the action starts. Since these secretions are alkaline, the acidity of the... Now, I told you, remember, I used to love pronouncing this as chyme. The reason is my spelling will not go wrong, but the actual pronunciation is actually chyme. So whenever you tell it in public, do not say chime and do not tell the tasa taught us. I am telling you this time, this term, in a way that I will be able to remember. That is the way I studied. Chime, chime, chime. So it's ch. If I would have studied chime, I do not know. I might have written it a different spelling. So in biology, to remember the spellings, pronounce it the way it is actually written. It helps you at times. But do not do it when you are speaking in public. So chyme is neutralized and pepsin is inactivated. So the moment the contents, the acidic content of the stomach comes down to the duodenum, it is neutralized by the alkaline contents of bile, pancreatic and intestinal juices. Next slide. Now most interesting part, what is the composition of bile? A lot of students asked me this question yesterday and I didn't answer yesterday in detail mainly because we were supposed to cover it today so now you have all the information that you have regarding bile bile or gall so this is also a gall because it's stored in gallbladder it's also called gall in english so bile or gall is a dark green to yellowish brown fluid produced by the liver of most vertebrates that aids the digestion of lipids in the small intestine in humans, bile is produced continuously by the liver. So liver is the organ which produces bile. So remember, bile is not produced by gallbladder. Bile is only stored in the gallbladder, which is a sac under the liver. It's a sac under the liver. So bile is produced and stored in the gallbladder and the hepatic cells produce bile and is concentrated in the gallbladder as we said after eating this stored bile is discharged into the duodenum so in the duodenum the bile is not coming directly from the liver after it is manufactured just like a company manufactures some product and then it has a storeroom where the product is stored a go down just like that the storeroom of uh, the bile produced by the liver cells is the gallbladder now i have a question over here do you know what is the inflammation of the gallbladder called? If this gallbladder is inflamed, and I have already covered what inflammation is, the ruba, the dolor, the calor, the tumor, the functionless, so all these things when it happens to the gallbladder, what that disease is called? Let me see. And what is the inflammation of the liver called? Let me see who can answer my question first. Inflammation of liver. And please, I'm again requesting do not Google do not google it will not help you in any way use your brains uh, ansh most people want me to continue and i prefer to continue because i want to get this over today itself so if you want you can leave in at 110 and you can see the recordings later on Yeah, Dandini has given the very right answer. It's called cholecystitis. Cholecystitis. So, col, cyst, chole is bile, a cyst or the cell that stores it, inflammation of that. So, cholecystitis is an inflammation of and I'm waiting for the liver inflammation. Yeah, Naeem uh, Ahmad Siddiqui has written Hepatitis, Shruti Bangare, Hepatitis, it's not Hepatotitis, it's Hepatitis. So Hepatitis is, uh, aren't it's not Liveritis, it's I told you anything regarding to the liver, in when you refer to biology, it's Hepa, it's not liver. So Hepato, hepa, Hepatic, so here it's Hepatitis. So Hepatitis A and B, you have heard of these terms. So Hepatitis and Cholecystitis. Now very quickly come back to the uh, lesson part. What is the composition of bile? So bile is a yellowish green fluid. 
and it contains water 97.6 percent i will try to big, uh, enlarge the picture for you see uh, water is 97.6 percent and solids are only 2.4 percent the organic substances present are bile salts bile pigments cholesterol fatty acids lecithin which is a fat and mucin which is a protein so we have already covered these things i'll just remind you in detail categorization you can see this chart later on and remember so organic substances are bile salts bile pigments cholesterol fatty acids lecithin and mucin and inorganic substances like sodium calcium potassium chlorides and bicarbonate so this is the composition of bile now let's come to the role that bile plays emulsification what is emulsification very simply if you try to understand what emulsification is try uh, to help your mother in dish washing today you know when you wash a dish that has been used oil is there so oil is fat so what you do basically if you try to just wash off the oil it will not go so you need an emulsifying agent or surfactant that helps to emulsify the lipid or the oil layer so you take some detergent powder and then you put on the thali and try to rub it with scotch, uh, scotch bright you will see the oil particles slowly come out of the surface of the thali that is called emulsification you know the surfactant role of the surfactant so the bile or gall act as to some extent as surfactant helping to emulsify the lipids in food bile salt anions are hydrophilic on one side and hydrophobic on the other side i'll show you the picture wait this is the bile salt the smaller one so you see uh, on one side it is hydrophobic that is it, it it's resisting water and one side it is hydrophilic which is attracted to water so this thing you see a lipid particle over here the hydrophobic side gets attached with the water uh, particle this uh, lipid particle so hydrophobic side gets attached to the lipid particle and what happens is it helps the continuous layer of oil to break down into smaller particles it covers it up just like this so that is what a detergent powder is doing the detergent powder covers up the oil particles and tries to separate it from one another so uh, it's hydrophilic on one side and hydrophobic on the other side consequently they tend to aggregate around the droplets of lipids so they try to aggregate around the droplets of lipids like triglycerides and phospholipids to form micelles so when they uh, make this particle separate separate particles of lipid this is called a micelle with hydrophobic side towards the fat and hydrophilic side facing outward the hydrophilic sides are negatively charged and this charge prevents fat droplets coated with bile from re-aggregating into larger fat particles so hydrophilic sides are negatively charged and this charge prevents the fat droplet coated with bile from re-aggregating so since one side is negatively charged the charges will repel to each other and because like charges will repel they will not aggregate ordinarily the micelle in the duodenum have a diameter of around 1 to 50 micrometer in humans so see uh, more particles like this what happens the hydrophilic side which side is negative if you see the hydrophilic sides are negative so you see this side is negative this side is negative it's entirely covered with negative charge and another negative charge which comes closer to it will be repelled by the negative charge so lipids cannot join each other so that is the way it is breaking down the lipids now let's come to the next slide pancreatic lipase now you see the role of the bile is just like a detergent powder while trying to wash a thali Now let's come to this pancreatic lipase. The pancreatic lipase, the dispersion of food fat into micelles, micelle I told you already, breaking down of the fat particles under the action of bile, provides a greatly increased surface area for the action of the enzyme pancreatic lipase. No wonder where it comes from. The parallel organ of the stomach. It is the pancreatic pancreas. 
and we have seen in the first chapter first picture rather how a pancreas looks like it looks like a cone it looks like a conical in shape almost like a leaf as well if you draw if you're drawing on a exam paper you can draw it like a leaf long leaf so the pancreatic lip lipase is there which actually digests the triglycerides and is able to reach the fatty core through gaps between the bile salts so now if everywhere it is covered with the bile salts how will the pancreatic lipase reach it is a gap in between these bile salts i'll try to show you the picture if possible so see these gaps small small gaps are there in between the bile salts why do you think these gaps are there this gap is there only so that the pancreatic lipase can reach the bile uh, the gaps from these gaps into the triglyceride and is able to react the fatty core through gaps between the bile salts a triglyceride is broken down into two fatty acids and monoglyceride which are absorbed by the villi on the intestinal walls so it is broken down into monoglyceride into fatty acids and those are taken up by the intestinal villi we'll go for intestinal villi how it acts later on after being transferred across the intestinal membrane the fatty acids reform into triglyceride did you know that this that after being transferred into the intestinal membrane the fatty acid that was broken under the action of uh, you know bile again joins because you know the bile salts are gone right now it's broken down into monosaccharide uh, and uh, sorry monoglyceride rather and fatty acids so since it's broken down again no cover of bile salt is there it again aggregates to form triglycerides and this is called re-esterification so bile breaks the fat molecules sorry the bile actually breaks the fat molecules into smaller particles intestinal lipase breaks it down into monoglycerides and fatty acids and these things go into the intestinal wall uh, inside the intestinal lumen captured by the villi and again because there is no coating right now of bile they will again aggregate and this process is called re-esterification so before being absorbed into the lymphatic system through the lacteals so the lacteals will now absorb these triglycerides and it is re-esterified the re-esterification process happens where in the inside the intestinal lumen so without bile salts most of the lipids in food would be excreted in faces undigested so if it was not the bile salt so you're thinking what is the role of the bile salt if it breaks down and ultimately again in the intestine it is joining so what is the use the use is that it has broken down that you know complex triglyceride into a monoglyceride and into fatty acids under the action of pancreatic lipase which again join and form triglyceride but this is a different nature of triglyceride and this triglyceride can be absorbed I will tell you later on when we go for fat digestion where actually it happens. Triglycerides are triple chains. When fatty acids are there in triple chain, teen cheese mil jata hai, that is triglyceride. Tri, when you say tri, di, mono, these are numbers we are referring to how many of the basic molecules are there to form that. So disaccharide, it is two. Trisaccharide, three monosaccharide mono is single so these numbers mono di tri poly it means multiple so these numbers tell it is a simple molecule or it's a complex molecule and if it is a complex molecule how many simple molecules make it up just like now i want an answer from you maltose is what maltose is what a monosaccharide a polysaccharide a disaccharide or anything else if you think of any other name you can write that what is maltose? Very quickly, can you tell me what is monos uh, maltose? Is it a disaccharide? Is it a monosaccharide? Or is it a polysaccharide? Yeah, it's a diglyceride. Am Amaya has given the right answer. It's a diglyceride. And uh, uh, you have rightly said. Very good. No, mono. It's not mono. It's two. Two glucose molecules bind together to form the 
maltose now let's come to the ppt one more time so pancreatic lipase you can see how it acts so it breaks down into monosaccharide into fatty acids absorbed by the intestinal villi into the intestinal lumen absorbed by the lacteals and then again under the action where the bile is not there covering it up they form triglyceride again let's go now to the next part and just for your info besides its digestive function bile serves also as a route of excretion of bilirubin a byproduct of red blood cells recycled by the liver bilirubin derives from hemoglobin of by glucuronidation glucuronidation so how is it you spell it glucuronidation glucuronidation so what is it function of bile the bile serves also as a route of excretion of bilirubin a byproduct of red blood cells so bilirubin is there in the bile which uh, specifically gives the color of the bile as well so what is the function of bilirubin we'll come to it again later on when we deal with excretory system so pancreatic juice what are the components of pancreatic juice now we have seen what is the component of bile how much water is there how many organic and inorganic substances are there we have seen it now we will come to the composition of your favorite juice pancreatic juice so pancreatic juice is produced by pancreas the pancreatic ducts open in the duodenum and pour their secretions there so pancreatic ducts open in the duodenum and pour their secretion there there are five enzymes present in the pancreatic juice trypsin chymotrypsin or you can pronounce it chymotrypsin so that you do not make mistakes in spelling trypsin chymotrypsin the original pronunciation for easy to remember chymotrypsin amylase lipase carboxypeptidases so these are the different enzymes present inside the pancreatic juice so properties of pancreatic juice is its volume will be around 500 to 800 ml per day reaction is highly acidic uh, sorry alkaline rather and it's 8 to 8.3 is the ph specific gravity is 1.0 to 1. it's like you can tell 1.0 only so it's one specific gravity is one so now you see trypsin chymotrypsin amylase lipase and car carboxypeptidases so these are the pancreatic juice components now we will see a very clear diagram what is happening this pink one is the duodenum ye jo pink dikhai de raha hai ye duodenum hai aur ye jo peela peela dikh raha hai ye pancreas hai this is the pancreas and you see pancreas ka ek part ko enlarge karke यहां पर दिया हुआ है पैंक्रियन पैंक्रेटिक असिनस एंड पैंक्रेटिक आइलेट्स ऑफ लैंगर हैंड्स आइलेट्स ऑफ लैंगर हैंड्स ऑफ पैंक्रियस इज अ टाइप ऑफ सेल्स पैंक्रेटिक असिनस इज आल्सो अ सेल व्हाट आर द डिफरेंसेस पैंक्रेटिक आइलेट्स ऑफ लैंगर हैंड्स इज बेसिकली एंडोक्रीन इन फंक्शन इट्स एन एंडोक्रीन इन फंक्शन एंड इट सिक्रीट्स योर हॉर दिस एंजाइम्स नो व्हाट आर दीस इंसुलिन एंड ग्लूकोगोन इंसुलिन एंड ग्लूकोगोन these are secreted by the endocrine function of the pancreas cells called islets of langerhans whereas the pancreatic acinus is the or are the cells which secretes the exocrine function or performs the exocrine function of the pancreas and this is the pancreatic juice so pancreatic juice does it come from the islets of langerhans the answer will be no it comes from the pancreatic acinus which is performing a function called exocrine function so pancreas there are two types of cells do tarah ka cells hai alag alag function ka ek tarah ka cell hai islets of langer hain jiska function endocrine hai aur ye insulin aur glucagon secretion karta hai aur acinus hai which secretes the pancreatic juice which we are dealing with right now so exocrine function of the pancreas the juice comes out from acinus cells and is drains into the duodenum so you see the duodenum so this brown color is the bile this is a, a gall bladder then there is a cystic duct which is a shop of a small protrusion over here that i'm putting the mouse on so this is called the cystic duct and it comes and join the liver ducts called hepatic ducts so now you see uh, if gall bladder is inflamed the doctors cut off this gall bladder 
so doctors cut off this gallbladder and gallbladder is removed now where if the gallbladder is removed where the bile will come from that time what happens the bile comes directly from the liver into the duodenum through this hepatic ducts and this is a common bile duct because it was taking hepatic bile as well as gallbladder bile into the duodenum but if the gallbladder is removed in cholecystitis operation then what happens then these uh, uh, you know the hepatic ducts they carry the bile from the liver this is called hepatic bile and fat digestion can still go on but not in the same way when the uh, gallbladder was there because it was a storehouse it was a storehouse so it was ready made supply so if now it is depending on the manufacture of the hepatic ducts it is to slow down so we cannot eat so much fat and fatty foods after the gallbladder operation is it clear with everyone what is uh, the exocrine and endocrine function of pancreas now in gallbladder uh, the juice comes over here the bile and comes into the duodenum and as well the pancreas secretes its juice into the duodenum so uh, if this part is clear you can just write so it's clear so that i can move ahead i'll try to cover it within the 30 minutes more max uh, by 130 we will cover whatever we cover till 130 it's fine is it okay with you is it clear so if it's clear please type clear and let me know it's clear so that i can move ahead great vedan tiwari it's clear nice all right now so we come next to the next slide trypsin chymotrypsin i i spelled it wrong over here so chymo and tri uh, trypsin and chymotrypsin what are the actions very quickly we have seen what bile does we have seen we will see now what pancreatic juice will do so trypsin and chymotrypsin present in pancreatic juice trypsin acts on the proteins and convert them into polypeptides so trypsin acts on the proteins and convert them into polypeptide do not forget this that proteins are acted upon by trypsin so proteins under the action of trypsin converted into polypeptide i'll try to make a space little bit more so that you can read it better and the chymotrypsin so this is a reaction protein acted upon by trypsin polypeptides chymotrypsin is an activated form of enzyme formed by the action of trypsin on inactive chymotrypsinogen so proteins acted upon by chymotrypsin it becomes polypeptides so but chymotrypsin is an activated form of enzyme formed by the action of trypsin so chymotrypsinogen to chymotrypsin happens under the action of trypsin so trypsin is the responsible factor for converting chymotrypsinogen into chymotrypsin and what chymotrypsin does it converts specific proteins into polypeptides so i hope it is clear with you proteins acted upon by trypsin it is converted into polypeptides and specific proteins acted upon by chymotrypsin which is being converted from chymotrypsinogen by the action of trypsin to convert protein into polypeptides now uh, if this is visible to you clearly i do not know it's clear visible or not but i'm going to read it out for you so that you can understand and you can make a note of it if you want the differences between trypsin and chymotrypsin the major difference so what is the inactive form of trypsin it is trypsinogen inactive form of chymotrypsin is chymotrypsinogen now who activates this trypsinogen into trypsin it's activated by enterokinase enterokinase is an enzyme inside the inside the inside the inter, intestine entero means related to intestine so enterokinase is something that will activate the trypsinogen into trypsin and who will activate chymotrypsinogen it will be activated by this trypsin itself so if you remember this uh, it will be easy for you to understand and what is the use the trypsin is used in tissue dissociation cell harvesting mitochondrial isolation in vitro protein studies etc and chymotrypsin is used in sequence of analysis 
peptide synthesis, peptide mapping. Do not get complicated with all these bombasting terms. Uh, I do not mean to confuse you. Just for info, anyone wants to pick it up, can remember. Not remembering, not to worry. Whatever basic you are remembering that much, it's more than enough. So remember, trypsin is activated by enterokinase, like trypsinogen activated by trips, uh, enterokinase becomes trypsin, and trypsin in terms activate chymotrypsin, and chymotrypsin uh, is activated from the inactive form chy chymotrypsinogen. So both make polypeptides. Now, uh, there are certain sugar breaking compounds in the pancreas as well. So pancreatic amylase acts on the starch and complex sugar and convert them into maltose. So starch and complex sugar is acted upon by pancreatic amylase, a sugar breaking enzyme present inside the pancreas. And that is converted into maltose. Now pancreatic lipase, fat breaking enzyme in the pancreas or pancreatic juice, it acts as a, on the emulsifies uh, fats and convert them, emulsified fats rather. So pancreatic lipase acts on emulsified fats, that is emulsified means fat broken down under the action of bile by both reaction, remember negative negative repairing how the detergent cleans up the oil, so that emulsified fat is acted upon by pancreatic lipase and converted into fatty acids and glycerol. So glycerol or glycerol, whatever you, way you remember, you can remember that spelling. Uh, so it's broken down by pancreatic lipase. So emulsified fats under the action of lipase, this is the reaction, is broken down into fatty acid and glycerol. And intestinal amylase causes sugars into maltose. Now procarboxypeptidase A. Procarboxypeptidase B. There are two types of procarboxypeptidases. In the pancreatic amylase, procarboxypeptidase was one of the component. Big name, procarboxypeptidase. Procarboxypeptidase A and B. So, enterokinase, an enzyme secreted by the duodenal mucosa, converts trypsinogen to trypsin. Now, enterokinase and uh, procarboxypeptidases are one and the same thing. Enterokinase and procarboxypeptidase are the same thing which converts trypsinogen into trypsin, which then automatically converts trypsinogen into trypsin. So it's a uh, autocatalytic reaction. So initially pro procarboxypeptidase will convert trypsinogen into trypsin and once trypsin is formed, the react uh, to start the reaction we needed the enterokinase or procarboxypeptidase once the reaction starts it goes on an autocatalytic reaction autocatalytic reaction where the uh, product itself is a catalyst so trypsin is a product itself starts acting as a catalyst to form more amount of trypsin so it started out by, on by the procarboxypeptidase if you remember Nandini asked a question yesterday uh, it was regarding the procarboxypeptidase So am I right, procarboxypeptidases are changed into carboxypeptidases under the action of trypsin. That's also right, procarboxypeptidases are also converted into carboxypeptidases under the action of trypsin. That's good enough, but remember that an enzyme secreted by the donor mucosa, enterokinase, converts trypsinogen into trypsin. All right, so now we have done till the pancreatic amylase part. Action of intestinal juice, it's also called as, we're coming from uh, the uh, stomach digestion to intestinal digestion. So succus entericus is the name of the intestinal juice. We will co complete this in one, uh, like another seven minutes. I hopefully will finish till 1.30, a lot of digestive process. Only the absorption will remain, remain which we can do later on. So, uh, Succus entericus is the name of the intestinal juice. It contains enzyme erepsin, which is mainly a group of peptidases. 
It also contains traces of maltase, sucrase, lactase, lipase, enzymes. By this time, food is completely digested and converted into a liquid form called chyle. So, the chyme that was there in the stomach, the bolus of the food in the esophagus, chyme in the stomach and in the intestine, it's called from chyme or chyme to chyle. M is replaced by L. So, uh, I, I think you look at the slide properly and we will go to the reaction part. Now you see the reaction. Intestinal juice, digestion of starch, maltose acted upon by maltase converts into glucose. Lactose, under the action of lactase, forms glucose and galactose. Sucrase, under the action of intestinal juice, forms sucrase, glucose and fructose. So sucrase, in fact it's not sucrase, it's supposed to be sucrose over here. Sucrose, under the action of sucrase, forms glucose and fructose. So lactose breaks down into glucose, galactose. Remember, lactose sounds similar with galactose. So lactose ko todenge to glucose to milega hi. Har bar jo todenge sugar ko glucose milega. Lekin yaad rakhne ke liye lactose ka saath galactose banega aur sucrose ka saath fructose banega. So sugar, fruit, remember this. Sugar and fruit. So sucrase will break down sucrose into fructose. Digestion of small protein molecules or peptones under the action of erepsin is converted into amino acids. Remember erepsin, we, we just learnt, learned what erepsins are. It contains erepsin, which is an enzyme inside the intestinal juice. So into erepsin, what it does? It converts peptones into amino acids. Trypsinogen under the action of enterokinase gets converted into trypsin. And digestion of fats, fats under the action of lipase forms fatty acids and glycerol. So this is the entire digestive system happening in the intestinal uh, lumen. I hope uh, it's, it's clear with everyone. I do not want to go for absorption today. We will try to cover absorption next day on Monday. By that time, you should have a quick revision of whatever I have told today. Uh, if anyone has any doubt, you can ask me right now. Do not ask weird questions. Try to be uh, very, very specific. Whatever I've covered, if you have not understood anything, let me know and then we can cover it up. Anyway, uh, today we have gone from digestion. I'll have a quick recap. Inside the mouth, saliva amylase is there. We have studied the composition of saliva. You see and note it down. You have to memorize it by studying it repeatedly. So there what happens? The starch or complex sugars are broken down into maltose under the action of salivary amylase or tylin. There is also lysozyme inside the mouth which breaks down the bacterial covering and kills the bacteria. Then it comes to the duodenum. In the duodenum, <coughs> it just passes on in peristaltic movement, reaches the stomach. When it reaches the stomach, it's acted upon by hydrochloric acid which converts the entire media into acidic. And when it becomes acidic, there is a pepsinogen which is an inactive form of uh, uh, it's an inactive compound which has been converted into active form pepsin under the action of hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is produced by which cells? And uh, which cells produce pepsin? Who can tell? Very quickly, hydrochloric acids are manufactured by which cell? Inside the stomach. I want the answers. If you can hear me quickly, let me know. Parietal cells, very good, parietal cells. And uh, now tell me who produces pepsin? The peptic cells, I also told some a different name. Chief cells, yes, chief cells. Very good, I've got the right answer over here. So under the action of pepsin, the proteins are broken down into what? Under the action of pepsin, the proteins are broken down into what? 
proteins are broken down into what? What are the components where protein is broken down under the action of pepsin? Uh, what are these two components? Yeah, Crick Sherry Parietal has given the right answer. Uh, right answer. Kushnagra, oxidizing cell, then secret hydrochloric acid. Uh, parietal cells and chip cells. Right answer. Multiple names are there in biology. You can follow anyone. No problem with that. <coughs> so I'm waiting for the answer. The question that I asked very quickly. Should I go back and show you one more time? Proteases and peptones. So proteases and peptones. Now very quickly, difference between proteases and peptones. Difference between proteases and peptones. I used a particular uh, compound's name. Who can tell that? Proteases and peptones, the differentiating compound name, what it is? Saturating, saturating. Yes, which compound? Proteases and peptones, which compound? Which compound differentiates them? Saturation of which compound? Very good. Nandini has given the right answer. Ammonium sulfate. Very nice. So now we have covered the protein digestion. What is the... Very quickly, this picture. What is this blue layer? Very quickly tell me, what is the blue layer? What is the blue layer? It's the mucus, right? Very good. So, uh, composition of bile, we have covered that part. We have covered what bile contains of. So, bile salts, bilirubin, biliverdin, cholesterol, fatty acids, all these components are there. Just take a look at the slide. You can save this slide. You can check it in the video and note down the composition of bile. Remember, uh, the brown color of the feces that we have, ex the excretory system when we study, the mixing of bilirubin, which is yellowish in color, and biliverdin, which is greenish in color, so yellow and green mixed together to form the brown color of the feces. So bilirubin and biliverdin mixed together gives the green color of the feces. So bile we have studied, we have studied emulsification, remember the thali washing example with detergent, that is what bile does, D detergent is just like bile, it breaks down the particle into small small droplets, one side is hydrophobic, the other is hydrophilic, so hydrophilic side face each other and outside side is the hydrophilic one which is negative, negative negative repel, it cannot join, now this is how the lipid particle looks like, so this is the hydrophilic side which is negative in nature and the particles are broken down. Pancreatic lipase contains, uh, like it break, breaks down by going through these small gaps and lipase is broken down. The lipase is there to break down this lipid into monoglyceride and fatty acid which is digested, absorbed by the intestinal villi and when it is absorbed by the intestinal villi, it again forms triglyceride and absorbed through the lacteals which we will study in the absorption part. So, uh, pancreatic juice contains five things, trypsin, chymotrypsin, amylase, lipase, and carboxypeptidase. This is the diagram which I showed you. Trypsin, getting converted into uh, trypsin from trypsinogen under the action of enterokinase. Chymotrypsin, getting converted into chymotrypsin from carbotrypsinogen under the action of trypsin and breaks down into polypeptides. Difference between chymotrypsin and trypsin we have seen. Inactive form trypsinogen and chymotrypsinogen. The next part was amylase of pancreas breaking down into sugar, from sugar into simpler substance like maltose. And emulsified fats broken down by lipase into fatty acids and glycerol. And procarboxypeptidases A and procarboxypeptidase B are two different types of enterokinase. 
An enzyme secreted by the duodenal mucosa converts trypsinogen to trypsin, which then autocatalytically convert more trypsinogen to trypsin. So, trypsinogen converted into trypsin under the action of enterokinase. And enterokinase, once it converts uh, that trypsinogen into trypsin, now trypsin will take over and start converting more trypsinogen into trypsin. Action of intelligence juice, which is called succus entericus. It contains enzyme erepsin and uh, what erepsin does? Erepsin basically uh, breaks the peptones into amino acids. Peptones broken down into amino acids under by the erepsin. And then we have got maltase which break down malt, maltose into, it breaks down maltose into glucose and lactose into glucose and galactose. So that's it. Uh, we will cover it up today. Let me see in the chat if some people are there. So all the reactions I've already shown you. We will study about the villi, which compose of the lacteal and other things tomorrow. I hope uh, everything is clear with you. Did you like today's class? Or is it too difficult? Should I go at this level or should I reduce my level? You can let me know. If you're thinking it's becoming very difficult, I will just reduce it to fit whatever is needed for 10th standard. So if you say, okay, not difficult, I will keep the level high. If you say it's difficult, I'll try to bring down the level a little bit. I have a call. I'll just quickly check uh, what teachers are telling. In the meantime, if you have any question, you can just uh, let me know. Welcome, Nandini. Thank you for uh, attending the class. Uh, Naeem Ahmed Siddhi, uh, I will reduce it. But you know, few children were asking a little bit deeper questions. So I thought of addressing their requirement as well. But from now on, I'll try to go in the 10th standard level. And what we will do is, uh, we will take one, diff you know, little bit above level class, maybe on the next day. Right, next day means on one of the days of the week, we'll go a little bit high, other days we'll be okay. Yes, Deshmukh ma'am? No problem, it's still going on. I'll see later on. What is the comment? Uh, let it be. I'm just in the middle of a class. I'll talk to you later. No problem. Okay, so uh, Vishnu Bakere and I think everyone loves it. Kush, Amaya, Suham also watching it from the other room. Manas Patil. Good. And uh, let me just tell you, uh, probably, probably on Monday, I'll inform you on, on this uh, chat. Uh, so the, Okay, I'll not tell right now. I'll tell it later on. Let me just fix it first. I don't want to reveal it straight away. But since you loved it, uh, I would like uh, everyone to know that uh, we will continue these classes even after the band, this uh, lockdown is over. This is something good and I hope you are enjoying it. And we will just have a small check. Just can you check if you are able to watch a video that I play. It's a test right now. So just let me know if a video I'm playing, is it visible or not?
Ooh. Thanks. Oh, you ate it already. I was really hungry. You want some more? <laughs> no, thank you. Ugh, I'm starving. Time for some real food. Coupon code. What are these weird websites? Are you able to see this or not? Let's see. Let's give ourselves a little bit of practice with percentages. So let's ask ourselves what, what percent, percent of, I don't know, let's say what percent of 16 is four and i encourage you to pause this video and to try it out yourself so when you're saying what percent of 16 is four percent is another way of saying what fraction of 16 is four is it visible it is the video visible percent as per 100. so if you said what fraction of four is or what fraction of 16 is four you would say well look this is the same thing as four sixteenths which is the same thing as equal, uh, this is the same thing as one fourth. But this is saying what fraction four is of 16. You'd say, well, four is one fourth of 16. But this still doesn't answer our question. What percent, what percent? So in order to write this as a percent, we literally have to write it as something over 100. Percent literally means per cent. It's the word cent, you know, from cents and century. It relates to the number 100, so it's per 100. So you could say, well, this is going to be equal to question mark over 100. All right. So I just want to test that. And there's a Thank bunch you. of ways that you could uh, think for participating. You could say, well, look, if in the denominator to go from four to So uh, thank you for attending the class. It was a long class, but uh, nice that students stayed glued in. And we learned a lot of things about digestion. And uh, we are best utilizing this time of uh, lockdown. So stay safe, stay happy, and uh, wash your hands every day with a lot of soap and water. And most importantly, drink a little bit of warm fluid every day. So make sure that your throat stays clear. And remember, saliva contains a lot of lysozyme. So chew your food well and uh, make sure that uh, tomorrow we are all together. As a nation, we will be switching off our lights at 9 p.m. and wave a light, either candle or torch light or mobile light for nine minutes. So that is what the prime minister wants us to do. And as a country, we will always do whatever the leader of the country is telling us. So make sure you turn off your home lights and, and turn on the lights of mobile and uh, candles and other things and definitely we will uh, hopefully we will see coronavirus going away very soon from us so thank you have a good day bye bye